this is a useful starting point because there are two, two visions of paradise. One is that paradise is a commodity. It's all about what you can buy. So paradise is this really nice resort on an island in the South Pacific. And if you can afford flying down to this island in the South Pacific, you will finally reach paradise. Or paradise is a nicer house, one on the bluffs, on the hills above Boise or whatever. Paradise, is under, under paradise is a commodity. Paradise is wonderful, but it's very expensive. It's exclusive. Only some people can afford paradise. Okay, so that's one vision of paradise. There's another vision of paradise, which is paradise is what we create in our own communities. It's not something that we buy. It's something that we make through our own behavior. And it's something that we each contribute to. It's not something that we take from the earth. It's something that we contribute to the larger community. OK, so keep that in mind as we proceed through this evening's discussion. And I say discussion because I like my presentations to be interactive. So I am going to do my best to get you guys involved. OK, so we're going to discuss some of these issues. Um, how are travel demands changing? What are the benefits of meeting these demands? What evidence is there to justify more tra transportation investment? What are uh, sources of opposition to that investment? Um, how can you, how can you, that is, how can you as a community overcome that opposition? And what would an optimal investment package look like? So this is, um, this is what, after, after um, working with um, Compass and uh, this afternoon I, I presented before the, um, your Senate Transportation Committee and after reviewing uh, the, some of the documents, these seem to be the, 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 the most pressing questions. And of course, this will bring in a, a lot of other issues as we go along. So I'm going to start off with a little academic question. What do we mean by travel demands? Well, demand is how and how much, travel demands means how and how much people want to travel. And the point I want to make is there are lots of different travel demands. There are freight and service vehicle demands. There's commuting to work and school. There's neighborhood <coughs> errands. There's social and recreational. There's tourism. There's inner city travel. There's mobility for people with disabilities. Each of those is a legitimate travel demand. Some people want to do that. And um, to some degree, the, the options that people can choose depend a lot on whether or not they can drive. So you can ask, what is the travel demand for a non-driver? What is the travel demand, you know, let's say the commute. What are the commute options available to somebody who can drive? And what are the commute options that are available to somebody who can't drive? And so we can use this to more specifically evaluate how well the community is doing to meet those travel demands. So let's think about how we were supposed to, what was predicted as the solution to our tra transportation problems in the past. It's really fun to go back to the science fiction literature, say 30 or 40 years ago, and see how we were supposed to be traveling in the 21st century. I remember when the 21st century was the way into the future. It was going to be very exciting to live in this time. We were going to never, no, nobody was ever going to deal with traffic congestion because we were all going to have flying cars. And when you did drive in a car, it would be a self driving, super fast sports car that comes with a pretty girl. <laughs> and, <laughs> but this one comes with the pretty, this is the pretty girl model. And you wouldn't have to walk anywhere because we all have segways. And how many of you saw the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, which promised that by 2001 you'd be able to fly to the moon in a Pan Am spaceship? Okay? So, answer me this. Who came here in a flying car? Raise your hand. <laughs> Segway? Who's been to the moon? Raise your hand if you've been to the moon. Okay. So, the future 
isn't what we were promised. But there is a very important new mode of transportation that really is new, unique to the 21st century. I can almost guarantee you won't see any photos of your family members using this before about 1995. What is the important new form of transportation that really does affect people's lives? The internet. Internet, yeah, well, uh, the internet is a little bit more than, I was using the internet in the late 80s, oh. and it's not physical travel. This is a form of transportation that I'll bet half the people in this room have used in the last couple months, and your parents never, your parents didn't use it on their honeymoon. What is it? Wheel luggage. Raise your hand if you've used wheel luggage in the past couple of months. Okay, I'm just about right, about half the room. Think about this. Your parents' honeymoon photos did not, almost certainly, did not include wheeled luggage. Or if it did, it was the old wheeled luggage with the little strap. It was a suitcase with wheels and a strap. Not the super nice, easy to navigate. Okay, what does this mean? That we thought we were going to fly to the moon and that was going to be really exciting. But the thing that really improves our lives is wheeled luggage. It turns out the most important form of transportation is walking. Let me ask you this. What was the high point of the trip to the moon? Walking on the moon. That's right, the moonwalk. What is the high point of a trip to the space station? Spacewalk. Spacewalk. You didn't realize it, but NASA <coughs> is just another public transit agency <laughs> that's <laughs> intent is to facilitate a nice walk. That's the real function of NASA. It turns out walking is the most important form of transportation. Think about airports. What is the main activity that goes on in an airport? Walking, walking around. The reason that airports are such great walking environments, and the reason that shopping malls are great walking environments, you've got wide, high, hallways, you've got super smooth surfaces, you've got ramps everywhere. If there's not a ramp, there's an elevator. The reason is because all of those business people running around from, from one, um, um, from one uh, gate to another <coughs> with their wheeled luggage, they need terrific pedestrian environments. So let me ask you this, how well does current transportation planning account for the very high value of walkability? Or let's flip that around. Do you think you could make a stronger case for the value of walkability if you recognize that virtually every other mode of transportation depends on walking access? I'll just give you a little example. I do a lot of work on parking management. So, you know, when this, when downtown Meridian finally becomes very economically successful, um, there'll, be a, there'll be a parking problem here. And they'll hire somebody like me. And one of the first things that I will do is I will ask, what are the walking conditions? How easy is it to walk from where you park your car to all the other potential parking spaces? Because walkability is often defines the number of parking spaces that can serve a particular destination. So, walk, so motorists benefit from good walkability. Public transit users walk, benefit from good walkability. Parents who don't want to be chauffeuring their children all over the place benefit from good walking and cycling conditions. It reduces the amount of driving that, that a motorist has to engage in. So, this is part of a paradigm shift, a change in the way we think about the transportation problem. In the past, well, well, there are two components of it. One is, in the past, we thought bigger was always better. So we defined planning in terms of growth. And now we realize sometimes you don't want to get bigger, you want to get better. And that means development. So we're shifting from focusing on growth to focusing on development. And we're shifting from focusing on mobility, which is physical movement, to accessibility. 
So in the past, let's say the, the roadway out here was getting congested, and we use the old model that focuses on growth and mobility. What is the solution to a congested roadway in the old paradigm? No. Because you grow it in order to increase, accommodate increased mobility. What other solutions could we deploy to that same problem if we think in terms of development and accessibility? How could we deal with roadway congestion? More robust network. Was that? More, more robust network. More in what more would that connections, more, more connections. More connections, right? So you so instead of having one highway between um, Boise and, and Meridian, you've got several. There don't have to be high speed arterials. They could be low speed arterials, but you've got several options. What else? Transit. Yeah, you could increase. You could you could deliver transport the same number of people in fewer vehicles using transit, using rideshare. <coughs> anything else? Move the step to where the people are. Mm -hmm. So you're using smart growth policies to reduce travel distances. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Maybe you could support people working at home so they don't have to commute, or telework, or um, um, shopping on the internet, or, um, or uh, children walking to school rather than having to be driven to school. Okay, so this, we have just gone through this exercise of changing the way we define problems from focusing from the old paradigm, which focused on growth and mobility, to, ac uh, to uh, development and accessibility. And we could go through all this complicated analysis um, of defining it. But if you are interested, get my IT journal article on the subject. OK, so, um, so let's start thinking about changing <coughs> travel demands. So changes in the amount and the type of travel people want to engage in. And so um, what I think is interesting is vehicle travel grew almost steadily through the 20th century. And then <coughs> soon after the beginning of the 21st century, it peaked. Interestingly, I wrote an article that predicted this. It was published in the IT Journal in 2006. It was called Changing Travel Demands and Their Implications for Transportation Policy. And it was extremely controversial. And that just happened to be of just about the time that vehicle travel was peaking. What you, you probably you have heard about this, but you may have only heard about one or two of the factors at a time. So it's the combination of vehicle ownership, saturation, aging population, rising fuel prices, increasing urbanization, increasing congestion, improving travel options, Changing consumer preferences, health concerns, and environmental concerns. So, yeah. Isn't it also the 16-year-olds um, are not getting their driver's license, and new millennials are not right. purchasing cars? Yep. They don't consider it to be a value proposition? That's right. Although, well, I would say that's changing consumer preferences. But yes. Under there. Okay. But you're absolutely right. There are a lot of young people who would rather spend their money on their mobile phone and on their cool computer that's capable of, of, of oh, gaming, me. then they want to spend on their car. Yeah. Would you also, this might also fall under changing consumer preferences, but would you also say the cost and maintenance of owning a car? Well, <coughs> yes. Although, actually, the cost and maintenance of the car used to, it, it hasn't necessarily gone up, but it has always been very significant. So, um, Essentially, if you live in a place where you have to own a car, you are 20% poorer than if you live in a place where you don't have to own a car. Um, maybe not 20%, let's say 15%. So it is a substantial cost, especially for lower income people. And so it certainly feels that way. Um, I mean, yeah, new cars, uh, newer cars, they're actually really durable. You know, a modern car is a pretty reliable thing compared with the old Volkswagen Bug that I had when I was your age. But, um, but then the repair costs are that much higher because I used to work on my own car. I used to adjust the tappets and change the spark plugs and, and fiddle with the carburetor. Who does that anymore? You know, so, so, so in some ways, vehicle 
ownership cost, or as vehicle costs have gone down, few less frequent repairs, but when the repair comes up, it's usually five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how much of the decline is due to these uh, motivators versus how much the recession has? There's been a lot of discussion of it. This started before any recession kicked in. It, it actually, the peaking occurred right at the peak of economic activity. Um, there probably is a component, but the growth rate hasn't recovered. Now, here's the fun thing. If you look at what departments of transportation <coughs> predicted, they, 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 they used increasingly sophisticated um, uh, mathematical methods to extrapolate past trends into the future. But they, it didn't occur to, to, or let's say, they didn't, none of the, none of the agencies who were responsible for predicting <coughs> future demands and putting those into models investigated the underlying demographic and economic trends that would affect that would make the future different than the past. So, so almost all of the models simply extrapolated the past trends. Does this ring true? You work in the field. Well, I haven't had as much exposure to them, but uh, but I do know that yeah, definitely when you look at past um, past actuals, uh, there is quite a bit of variance. So let me just explain what's going. What this graph is. The black lines are what are the amount of VMT that actually occurred. And all these lines are what various government agencies predict, predicted or predict the, the growth rate is going to be. And they consistently exaggerated. And so the fact that about three weeks ago, the US Federal Highway Administration very quietly readjusted its growth rate downward. OK, this is it, actually, here. So, so yeah, I think this is it. Is they said, OK, maybe it's going to grow at half the rate that we predicted. They're still assuming a growth. That's the dotted line. Yes, that green line is the revised um, um, US Federal Highway um, uh, prediction. That, yes. that graph's making an assumption that something's going to change in order for it to go up like that. Because what's going to reverse the trend? The trend is not reversing. Well, right. I mean, what they did, what, what kind of, what may be confusing is if you go back, it was that very stri straight right. line. So you were looking at this, and you used this very sophisticated mathematics to, to extrapolate that. this yeah. trend. <laughs> and that is the antithesis of good planning. Planning means you try and under, understand the underlying factors. You're not just looking, you're not extrapolating past trends. Imagine what would happen if you did that with your children's <coughs> shoe size. You would be building both size shoes, yes? There, just, there was a report that came out. There were some researchers that were looking at the uh, using the IT trip generation manual and the projections for like yeah. per household trip generation. Right. And, and then they compared it to the actual That's right. uh, to American community survey data right. the reported That's actual right. travel. And That's there's right. discrepancies. That's right. The thing that was very important is they looked at the at the vehicle trip generation rates in smart growth communities. So basically, what the, the ITE trip generation manual and parking generation manual are based on surveys primarily done in suburban areas because that's where it's easier to do the surveys. And so there's this whole very sophisticated body of literature that is very precise. They'll actually predict your trip generation to three or four significant digits. And it's very inaccurate for a lot of situations. And so actually, I, my latest um, planetism blog is on exactly is on some of this stuff. And so there's been, and, and I've been in debates with the ITE, on the ITE um, forum on exactly this thing, because there are still some members of the Institute of Transportation Engineers 
that don't want to believe this. They want to find weaknesses in the in these studies rather than figure out what it actually means. Yes. Would you? Uh, I, I see how this would work in an urbanizing area. Would you see this as a as a state like Idaho to lag? It may still follow this right. trend, but we might be years behind. Okay. So it just so happens, here's the, <coughs> my, this is my next slide. It deals exactly with this. Um, this is Idaho. This is a comparison of vehicle miles traveled per person in 2011. The change between 2005 and 2011, the year that vehicle travel peaked. And now this is all, keep in mind, this is all per capita. But what this is showing is that Idaho's uh, VMT peaked in 2009 at 11,171. And it's and by 2011, it was down to 10.55, a 10% reduction, or 1,116 miles reduced <coughs> per capita. And it actually, Idaho was one of the <coughs> earliest. Now, one of the things that's going on, now, oh, oh, I, I'm, of course, Idaho's population grew quite a bit during this period. So VM, I've, I've been trying to get somebody to give me the data on actual VMT, and I haven't found it yet, but it's probably about flat. Yes? Does this, so I've, I've seen some data that has split out commercial trips from personal vehicle trips, and right. that shows that personal vehicle trips have actually declined significantly more, and that more recently, because of the, um, the demand for rail travel by the oil industry and the coal industry, that commercial vehicle travel has increased significantly. And so that if we can tease those apart, actually personal trips may be down even more than what we're thinking. Well, yeah. Uh, now, <coughs> depend, it kind of depends on exactly how you define and measure commercial vehicles. But I usually, m most estimates that I see indicate that true, c or let's say freight vehicle, yeah. represents like 10% of all travel. And then you could include, let's say, business people going on a... Yeah, on a, I'd be talking for you. Yeah. So that's like 10% of VMT. Of course, in terms of ton miles, in terms of value, you know, it, it's in terms of fuel consumption, it's much higher. It's proportionally higher. But in terms of VMT, you look at... Yeah. So... so um, what is, I, okay, so let me go through a couple more slides and we'll come back to this. Now, this is from this graph that, or this report um, that looks at the trends in, in each of the U.S. states. And in terms of total VMT per capita, Idaho is pretty much in the middle. And in terms of the change between 2005 and 2011, Idaho is pretty much in the little, middle. So. Um, for, you know, I don't know if you're proud of it or whatever, but you're average. <laughs> um, but this is where I think it's important to go back to, to this and start asking, what are the subcomponents? And I'm pretty sure, I, again, I'm the outsider. I really haven't had time to do any re <coughs> detailed research. But my, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you do collect the data, you will find that Rural uh, Idaho is aging significantly. That the, that the number of people is declining and the age of people is increasing in rural areas. And basically, when you retire, your, your annual VMT cuts in half and then continues to decline every year after that. That's the, the normal pattern. And so if that's true, my guess is that most of this, a good portion of this reduction in VMT in Idaho is rural people getting old and retiring. And, and in terms of some of the things we'll get to later, which is the value of a diversified transportation system, this is very important, because if it's true that most of the population growth in Idaho is in your cities, then the travel demands there can be shifted to walking, cycling, and public transit. That is, I'm not saying Idahoans, is that the right word? Idahoans. Idahoans are going to all give up driving altogether. 
But at the margin, compared with the amount of driving they were doing two years ago, a lot of people would prefer to drive less and rely more on walking and cycling and public transit if you have those good options. So if cities like Boise and the other urban areas, and it doesn't have to be a city, it can be a small town, if they have, if they put more of their resources into improving walking and cycling conditions and making sure that there's basic bus service, local bus service, and that all of the cities are well connected with, with inner city service, <coughs> that that actually responds to the residents' demands, their preferences to be driving marginally less. That's what, this is my hypothesis, and it's going to be up to you to, to demonstrate that. If that is true, let's think about what that means. And this, these are some of the, these, I think, are the types of stories that if you're a, <coughs> if you're a proponent of improving walking and cycling and public transit, you need to be able to tell stories that convince somebody who's currently automobile dependent that it is worthwhile for them to support improving travel options. So let's ask this. Say you're a rural resident and you hope to be able to stay in your community. You hope to age in place. What does your community need so you can stay living in your current home when you're in your 70s and 80s and maybe into your 90s? You, need, you probably need some what we call community transit or public transit. How well is Idaho doing, it, particularly your State Department of Transportation doing, to make sure that a rural resident will have some basic mobility options? Okay. Do you think that would resonate, that idea would resonate with some rural residents who currently could care less about public transit? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a story, it's a hook. Similarly, many tra traffic safety strategies are based on trying to get high-risk drivers to reduce their driving. So we have um, uh, graduated licenses programs so that young people have to go through more hoops to get a driver's license. We have anti-drunk driving and anti-distracted driving campaigns. We have um, testing for seniors, so when somebody turns 75 or 80, they get more tests to make sure they've got the cognitive function. Okay, all, all these programs are based on the assumption that somebody can give up driving. To be successful for an anti-drunk driving, program to be successful, we have to guarantee that you can get to and from a drinking establishment without a car. When I go for a date with my wife, we walk to our local pub. In fact, we have about a half a dozen high quality microbrew type pubs within walking distance of our home. We live in one of the old neighborhoods in Victoria. Raise your hand if you have a good pub or tavern within convenient walking distance of your home. We've got half of you here. The other half are drinking establishment deprived. And <laughs> I would argue that having We're good drinking is impaired. Well, um, would you rather I drive home or walk home from my drinking establishment? You are better off if I live within walking distance of a pub. It doesn't matter whether or not you drink you are still better off if your neighbors can, if it's normal. Now, think of zoning codes. What land use category has the highest minimum parking requirements? Restaurants. Restaurants and pubs and bars. Answer me this. What, how does it, how, you know, it is, it is logically dysfunctional to on one hand require every bar to have a generous amount of parking, and on the other hand to tell people don't drink and drive. <laughs> and those minimum parking requirements are what often prevents a pub developer from locating in the neighborhoods. So part of it's, there are many facets to make the traffic safety strategy, and I can show you, I just completed some research, 
uh, published in the Journal of Public Transportation just uh, a couple months ago, uh, called The New Transit Safety Narrative, points out, it provides research showing if you live in a city with high quality public transit, so a city where the average resident is using public transit more than 50 times a year, so we're not talking New York, we're talking, um, uh, well, Seattle, um, um, me some medium sized cities are, are achieving this. Uh, uh, Eugene, Oregon, I think, has it. Okay, your traffic, the overall per capita traffic fatality rates are half of what they are in the more automobile dependent communities. And you find the same effect if you disaggregate and measure neighborhoods rather than cities. <coughs> much, much lower traffic fatality rate in the walkable, bikeable, transit oriented neighborhoods. So, traffic safety is another component of explaining why people who don't use public transit and don't walk and never bicycle should support those modes. And then think about children traveling to school. If you are a normal over 50 year, you walk to school. If you are a normal under 30 year, you were probably chauffeured to school. Do children now have a shortage of feet? Is there, has there been a loss in the number of feet people have over a generation? No. What has changed? Schools are bigger and farther away. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Longer travel distances and, let's see what I've got here. That's right. Let me show you what happened. People are paranoid. Exactly. People are par they're fearing the wrong thing. Okay, where is it? There, there. This is what happens. It's, it's a self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. Now, this is the negative way. I like to turn things into positive statements. What can you say? How can you talk about travel demands that turn this into a positive statement? A lot of children and their parents would prefer that Junior gets to, get, gets to school by walking and cycling. And if we did a better job of ensuring safety, a lot of children would do that. That's the positive statement. People want, there are some trips, and it's not just children going to school. I would, I would argue that there are, that uh, an efficient transportation system ensures that when you do want to walk to a local service, that you can. That's, that's, that, it's as inefficient if somebody has to drive for a trip that could easily be made by walking, as it is inefficient if somebody's forced to walk for a trip that is a distance that should be driven. Does that make sense? That both of them are inefficient. If you have to walk farther than is, than is optimal, that's inefficient. But if you have to drive a short distance, that's inefficient. And yet, our transportation planning process recognizes one. It says, we, we're going to do everything we can to make it easy to drive. And it says nothing about, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that if you do want to walk or bike, that you can do that. OK, so another example is campuses. Many colleges and universities have parking and traffic problems. And automobile ownership is a major financial burden on a lot of, young, a lot of students. Many campuses are now implementing transportation management programs that improve affordable modes and encourage use of these modes instead of driving. How well are the universities in, in Idaho doing to implement uh, transportation management programs? Free bus ridership. They, you do. You have a U-Pass. Yeah. Fantastic. And do, does, do the buses run late at night so that if you're going out drinking? Nope. nope. I, I can't use a single bus route to attend any of my graduate classes because they're all taught at night after yeah. the bus system. Right, right. And what about improving walking and cycling to campus? Are there, are there good programs to do that? Yes. Um, on, on campus, they've done an awful lot to improve cycling, um, including the addition of a lot of bike lanes. One of the biggest problems is the emerging residential area for campus is across the university, and there's not good crossings of university. Yeah. There is a project to add another crossing next year. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, 
I'm the outsider, I know nothing about the details, but this is what a lot of universities are doing this, and it usually starts because they have a parking problem, but then they, it becomes this integrated thing, and I suspect that there are an awful lot of people who would have had to drop out of university and college, or would have graduated with twenty or $40,000 of debt, that because they go to a campus where you don't need to own a car, they're able to save three and five thousand dollars a year. Okay, so you know, if you look at conventional travel surveys, they will imply that heck, only five percent of households are zero vehicle households. Therefore, everybody is a motorist. Virtually everybody is a motorist. But there are other ways to define the demands for alternative modes beyond just the household scale. So you can look at pretty much any, everybody who's too young to have a driver's license, or let's say adolescents, demand walking, cycling, and public transit. Some seniors, people who are over 70, adults who can't drive to, due to a disability, law-abiding drinkers, <coughs> lower-income households that want to minimize their automobile expenses, people who walk a bike for enjoyment and health, pets that want to be walked for enjoyment and health. Motorists who want to avoid chauffeuring on drivers, motorists who want convenient parking, residents who want less air pollution. These are all people who you could say directly benefit from improved walking, cycling, and public transit. When defined this way, the, the, the population of users, or the, the, the amount of latent demand becomes much bigger than travel tra transportation planners usually define it. So this is this is about valuing transportation diversity, valuing the quality of walking, cycling, and public transit. And we can demonstrate, there's a lot of research um, looking at things like what the amount that households spend on transportation based on where they live, or the traffic fatality rates, or um, exercise rates, and, and, and physical fitness, and, and, and other impacts. And it turns out if you live in a more walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented community, there are some benefits that you couldn't get if you lived in automobile dependent. So here's one of the ways that I like to think of it. Um, I aspire to grow old. Does anybody else aspire to grow old? You look for it. It might not be great, but it's better. I already did it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well. Is it better than the alternative? That's what I say. Exactly. <laughs> OK. If you're lucky, you're going to grow old and be physically able, and you're going to be affluent, and you can continue to drive up into your 90s. That's the optimistic. But my grandmother said, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. What should you be preparing for? What kind of community do you want to create just in case your future self is physically disabled or impoverished. Well, good walking and cycling and public transit is pretty useful. You might not need it, just like I've never had to use a lifeboat, but I'm glad when I travel on BC ferries, I'm glad to know there are lifeboats on board. If you're planning to grow old in your community, you can very selfishly say, I want to make sure that there is good walking, cycling, and public transit, that we apply universal design so people can get around in little, in wheelchairs and scooters in my community because I want to be able to do that. Highway engineers design roads to accommodate what they call the design vehicle. What is the design vehicle for a sidewalk? What? Somebody walking? Anything else? Wheelchair. wheelchair. Yeah. At, least, at least a wheelchair. Okay. Anything else? A stroller. Okay. Um, scooters. Scooters. All the kids in my life. Should should seniors be able to walk a dog when they're using their wheelchair or scooter? Okay. So a, a, a walker or a scooter with a with a, an animal on a pet, on a leash. Should seniors be able to engage in romance? When I'm, when I'm in a wheelchair and my wife is, is using a walker, should we, able to, should we have sidewalks that can accommodate us walking side by side? 
I'd like that. It's conversational. Okay, so under certain circumstances, maybe the design vehicle for a sidewalk is two wheelchair users, or one wheelchair user and a walker side by side. Um, isn't that a romantic thought that we're going to grow old together and use our. Okay, so then. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about economic development. Um, this is the slide that um, these folks, colleagues Chandler, produced in his presentation last year. Um, <coughs> so, uh, this is simply a way to, con or to give some numbers behind the statement, um, most economic activities require at least some transportation. And the converse of that is, a, an inadequacy of transportation constrains economic activity. So there are many ways to, that you can measure this, um, and, and components of this, and we don't have time to get into it. If you do a uh, higher economic development uh, research group that happens to have at least three representatives here, and they'll be glad to, to do the work, to do the analysis. But, and a lot of it is really common sense. You can ask what economic activity, and especially you could even go back to thinking about demands. What are some of the demands that are associated with economic activity? So people going shopping, getting to work, businesses delivering products, industries delivering raw materials, tourism, tourists visiting, and you can ask, to what degree is some of this economic activity constrained because there isn't good enough transportation? In the past, the focus was on traffic congestion. And I think that there are many other transportation components that, that, that should be taken into account. So anyway, here's the question. So this leads us to the, to the, to the <coughs> million dollar question. Um, is there a case for, is there an economic case, a business case, for investing more in um, transportation than, than Idaho currently does. Absolutely. Okay. How would you convince? Well, if we say that traffic growth is peaking, how would you respond to somebody who says, we don't need any more money. The roads are already built. Okay, well, here's one component. It turns out the the amount of money generated per vehicle, the amount of tax money, transportation dollars generated per dollar, per dollar uh, uh, mile driven is declining. So that's this red. So this is, uh, now, when you talk about cents per mile, it always seems too small. So I, I calculated revenue per, state revenue per 100 vehicle miles. And it turns out in the 1970s, it was, um, you, you paid uh, about 60 or 65 cents in fuel taxes per 100 miles driven. But that's equivalent to more than $2 in current dollars. And this value, through inflation and increasing fuel efficiency, has actually plummeted quite a bit. It's half of what it was at its peak. Most of, the, most of the amateurs out there, they don't quite understand this concept that a unit tax declines in value over time. An income tax it always rises in value because you get to a new category, but it, a unit tax, it always declines. And so there's a pretty good case for indexing. Here's another way to think of it. I happen to be the proud owner of a heritage house. That's my, that's my wife there. Um, we've spent a whole bunch uh, on, on maintenance, repairs, maintenance, rehabilitation. And I am very proud of that asset. Is anybody proud of Idaho's highways? Is there anybody who's <coughs> really excited about their highways? There needs to be. Um, you're, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a unique asset. 
If a particular bridge fails, you can't just go to the next, you usually, you often can't go to the next one. The, a bridge is a unique asset, a road is a unique asset. And yet, um, Idaho's roads and bridges are aging. Um, and this is what happens. Uh, you have to be a, an engineering economist to really love this graph. But basically it shows that when your, the, your, your, your lifespan, when your asset's lifespan reaches a certain point, it becomes extremely expensive to replace, to repair and replace. Or another way to think of it is <coughs> if you drove your car to failure and then fixed it, it would cost 10 times as much as if you just did a little bit of maintenance instead. You never changed your oil, and you never fixed your tires. That is going to be a really expensive repair. And it's exactly the same with things like roads and public transit vehicles. Do you think most people, um, in, do most Idaho citizens understand this? that when you say we're going to put off the fuel tax or a tax increase, you're essentially saying we're going to pay even more in the future, that we're leaving a legacy of debt for future. <coughs> and the ironic thing is they, a lot of these people say they justify it because they say they're conservative. It's actually the opposite of the term conservative. They're not conserving resources if you're allowing a valuable asset to fail. Okay, so all this was investigated in the 2011 Governor's Task Force. Who's read the Governor's Task Force report? Okay, I we got, yes. And so you probably noticed that Idaho is on the lower end. It's not the lowest, but it's on the lower end of most uh, transportation taxes. And so then you ask, okay, what do voters think about this? And there was this nice study done by um, a group at one of the universities here in Idaho a few months ago, right? Just uh, came last spring. Last year. Okay. And it asked voters to, um, to eva evaluate various funding levels. Did voters want better transportation? Do they want good transportation? Yes. Do they want better maintenance of their facilities? Yes. Do they want to raise taxes, yes. Do they want to bear the taxes that they raise? No. They want higher taxes on somebody else. That's basically what, what this shows. Um, I suspect there's a lot of wishful thinking. But this is the reality, is the average voter is selfish and stupid. And so if you're going to generate more revenue, you have to you have to figure out what appeals to voters. They are running, when they go into that voting booth, they are using their reptilian brain. They are not thinking rationally. So what does it take? Let's brainstorm a little. What would it take to convince somebody to say, yes, raise my taxes? Disaster. Okay, so a frightening image of what kind of disaster? Bridge collapse. Okay, that's a very dramatic. Um, unfortunately, bridge disasters are not frequent and predictable enough. <laughs> what are you going to do until? What strategies? Let's say you are Don Draper, the super advertising man. What hooks could you come up with? What storytelling? It's really a matter of storytelling. What stories could you tell? Yes? Well, I, I don't know that I have a story, but I've been wondering if part of the story is that the ways in which we've been using the money that we do have in the most recent past are not ways that people see a lot of benefit from. So you're thinking that, um, or is this getting back to this idea of transportation diversity, that people want yeah. better options and the focus is too narrow? Now, and, 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 and having to live through a construction project so that you get a wider road that then is a, as congested as the other. So people keep. are skeptical. Does it perceive to be an improvement? You know, you, I think you could argue both ways. That there are some people who would, who would distrust using any um, vehicle user fee revenue for anything other than highways. 
And on the other hand, you could argue that part of the reason you're not getting support is some people want alternatives. So my own um, response is that the challenge is to build coalitions that cut through what are sometimes surprising um, differently different interests. So for example, one I think one of your one of your strongest new allies are medical or public health professionals who are very concerned about people not getting enough exercise and about the traffic accident rate. So what would it take for the coalition in favor of increased transportation funding to include health professionals? Well, you would have to guarantee that the program is going to include some walking and bicycling improvements. And maybe some of the research that I'm showing about the, the safety benefits of, of improving travel options. Um, yeah? Uh, you could present it as this is how much you could pay now in terms mm -hmm. of taxes, or if you want to defer it, you could pay this much amount a little bit later. That's right. Or you could say these are the businesses that chose not to come here because of your transportation system, or these ones that may come, or That's you, right. you will lose these. Absolutely. I think those are the kind of messages, and therefore the type, the, 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 the interests that you can include in your coalition, in your political <coughs> coalition. So you should be able to get um, transfer, a, a lot of businesses to support increased funding. You should be able to get uh, anybody involved in tourism. Um, you should be able to get uh, anybody interested in safety? Um, what was the other one? Um, so, anyway, to me, this is the challenge: is to f to make sure that you have something for everybody. So the temptation is to say, okay, we're going to focus on the biggest groups, on the the low hanging fruit, and. I think the better approach is to try and find something for everybody and then and get them to make that commitment. Oh, so from what I understand, um, you, somewhere there's a map that shows all the bridges that are beginning to, to reach failure. And conceivably, you could do a time series where you could say, here are the number of bridges that, are fa that, that were failing testing in, or the were, had, had limited load factors in 1990, in the year 2000, in the year 2010, and now in the year 2015. Has that been done? Is it, is, does that map, do those maps exist? Yes. It was on the Press Tribune the other day. Okay. And so a lot of people have seen that? The legislators have, yeah. Okay. I'd say that, that in order to get, in order to allow the legislators to, to be to, to, to stick their necks out, that, that the word has to go out to the general public. Right. The other thing that I think would be a very powerful message is to get some of your district uh, highway engineers to show how many roads that are currently paved will have to revert to gravel unless there's an increase in funding. Do those maps exist? Yes. Okay. Do the, does the general public have they has the general public seen that? It's in the process. Yeah. I think that that's a very powerful statement. If nothing else, because you know that if you're driving on those gravel roads, you're, you're going to have to spend hundreds of dollars a year in window chip repairs and vehicle repairs and tire replacements. And so you could, you can calculate the cost to a household that, that lives on a now gravel road. And those, I think, are the kind of stories that will be very persuasive. So. So the state of California does something similar, but they, they use a rather odd term called sufficiency rating, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, uh, structural rating. Right. And sufficient, their sufficiency rating includes uh, um, lane capacity. Mm -hmm. So right. they embed within their calculations demands for road widening. Right. right. And, and <coughs> a, a bridge technically could fall below a sufficiency rating. Right. And yet, it's perfectly sound structure. Yeah, and the federal 
Highway Administration, or the federal government does the same thing, is they have two, two ratings. One is structural, and the other is capacity, or some other. And yeah, I, I, I think they're, they're, that the, the, the amateurs out there, the, the, un, the people who are not engineers, have a little bit of reason to be skeptical when, for example, the engineering, uh, the American Engineering Association comes out with a report that says how many billions of dollars the U.S. has to spend, because there's obviously some self-interest there, and, and so they're um, going. So the, the the professional organizations are te are, are probably going to use a higher value by doing things like what you just described. So I think we do have to be very clear what we're measuring and be able to respond to that kind of uh, skepticism or criticism. But, you know, I think that there's a pretty strong case for saying the basic, you know, just focusing on the basic maintenance and rehabilitation will require an increase in funding. If you don't do that, it's, you're, you're leaving a legacy of debt. Just as if you borrowed cash now. You're, 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 you're. And I think, I think it's, a, again, that matter of of telling stories. Here's part of the story. How much does an average household spend on vehicles? This is all per capita. More than $3,000. How much do you spend on roads? $600. How much do you spend on parking facilities? Well, if you had to cost out your the garage at your home, your residential parking, and the parking space that you use at work and the, your share of parking space at various stores is probably between $500 and $2,000 if you live in a low land value community. And if you were in a big city, it would be even more. And um, what does an automobile association membership cost? $120 a year. How much does the, is the, um, how much would be needed to bring your Idaho highways up to standard? How many additional dollars per year per, per capita? Anybody calculate that out? Oh. Uh, it's 262 divided by 1.6 million. And that's an annual? Yeah. Uh, 262, 262 million divided right. by 1.6, so, so it's about 10 bucks. 10. What? That would be about 10 bucks, wouldn't it? No, 150. 150, yeah. Yeah, 150 under 60. Um, no, 15. 262 divided by uh, 106. It's too oh, late yeah, for yeah, me yeah, to do any of this. But anyway, this is, this is how I would present it. I would present it compared with things like what it costs for you to own and operate your car, and what does it cost for an automobile association membership, and what will it cost, what is the logical, the likely incremental cost if the roads really got bad, what would it cost in additional vehicle repairs per year, and give people the sense that I'm going to get a return on my investment. And I think that needs to be in story form. Do you have a comparison of um, what we're spending on roads versus other utilities? Right. Cable TV, right. cell phones. That's right. And, and I mean, it's compared to that. Exactly. I mean, I'm spending, I'm supporting a family of mobile phones. Um, it's 150 a month on mobile phones compared to uh, we're 150 spending, a year. Well, we're spending $300. Okay. I've got two, <laughs> two university students. Um, so anyway, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, and you know, as a trick, um, if you want something, if you want something to sound expensive, you calculate it over the lifetime of that asset. And if you want something to sound cheap, you talk about cents per day. <laughs> so you can say, this is only going to cost you 17 cents per day. Well, 17 per cents per day is probably 30 Oh, we're doing a month per month. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. But in any case, right. I mean, I don't think you want to manipulate yeah. the numbers, but you want to put the incremental cost compared, compared with things yeah. that people, Starbucks. compared with the, the total cost of the transportation, and compare that with the past. So, so be able to show what an inflation adjustment per capita expenditure on roads was like. So 
Anyway, let me, let's <coughs> proceed. Uh, there's this interesting thing. The, the last travel survey had this very interesting question. It asked people to prioritize transportation problems. What do you think came at the top? Was it traffic congestion? No. Affordability. Inaffordability is the American public's, American transportation users' highest priority. How well does transportation planning respond to the concerns about affordability? Terribly. Especially when you consider that two-thirds of the cost of the vehicle are fixed costs. So even if you reduce fuel taxes and therefore fuel prices by, let's say, 20%, that still only works out to be about a 7% change in your overall transportation costs. So the true way to deliver affordability, if you really are literally concerned with affordability, is to help households that want to reduce their vehicle ownership do that. So allow a household that currently owns two cars to go to one car. So, so instead, of having, instead of having parents chauffeur children to school, and so you, have to, you need that second car, um, you live in a neighborhood where children can walk to school. And instead of every commuter driving to work, that sometimes you use public transportation or you ride share. And that is true affordability. And there's good research that, put, that quantifies this. There's this work on what's either called location efficiency or location affordability or transportation and housing affordability. What it points out is a cheap house in an isolated location is not truly affordable. That, this, that in almost every case, the transportation cost savings are offset by increased transportation costs. So what this shows is yellow shows areas where the average house costs less than 30% of the household's income for housing. So a lot of Boise region has cheap housing. But here is, are the areas where housing and transportation costs combined are less than 45%. And what this shows is your most affordable areas are actually the ones that are in the center where households don't have to own that second car. And that the areas out here are unaffordable if you take into account both transportation and housing. Now this sounds really negative. What's the positive statement that you can make? That by creating more affordable housing in a walkable, transit-friendly area, you are delivering something that people care about a lot, which is affordability. And even if you start off, there's some interesting research showing that housing foreclosure rates are much lower in the accessible locations, in the transit-oriented neighborhoods. So you might start off thinking you can afford that expensive house, and then you lose a job, or you have a car crash, or you have a medical problem, or something like that, and suddenly you're struggling to maintain that. If you live in an accessible location, you can shed a car. You can decide. Your household goes from owning two cars to one car. But you lack that option if you're in an automobile dependent location. Or another way that I, some of the analysis I do, looks at, okay, what does it cost to live, what is the additional subsidy required? for your community to deliver really high quality public transit. And it turns out it requires about $268 in additional subsidies, and you're gonna spend about $104 in additional fares to live in, in, in a really good transit-oriented community. On the other hand, you're gonna save more than $1,000 a year in avoided transportation costs. So you get about a 300% return on investment from your transportation investments. This is assuming it's spread over 100% of the population. It's using average, that's right, community-wide average expenditures on transportation and community-wide transit subsidies. Spread over 100% of the population. That's right. The problem is the people that are saving the money on the parking and the transportation are not the ones that are paying the subsidies. 
Well, it is. That's part of it. And also, we glorify car ownership. So for a lot of people, if you, unless, until you realize, until you see walking, bicycling, public transit as a desirable lifestyle, you're tempted to say, oh, I would just own the car anyway. I would live, you know, I would pay more in taxes, but I wouldn't actually save any money. I don't think getting rid of cars is going to be most people's goals, but going from two to one, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But that, exactly. So I think, I think the challenge for you is to convey that living a multimodal lifestyle <coughs> is really exciting, that it frees you up. A lot of young people now, um, you know, actually Hollywood, or Hollywood Television Land has done a really good job of doing this. It, when I was growing up, Television Land was full of suburbanites living automobile kind of lifestyles. And then, in the last few years, the really attractive people on television, a lot of them live apartment in apartments in an urban area, and some of them have cars, but that's usually a joke. They're usually very bad drivers. Okay, think of Friends and Seinfeld and, you know, all those TV shows. Um, uh, um, uh. So, for at least some people, I think they're ready to see themselves as living a multimodal lifestyle. But, I don't think a lot of them are middle-aged residents of Idaho. <laughs> so your challenge is going to be to active voters. Yeah, there yes. you go. Your challenge is to say that even if you don't see that lifestyle attractive to you right now, that you should that you may want to put that into place and you can tell story. Maybe you want your your children, your you know, your your children to return to that have moved away to the big cities to return to live in Idaho and they want to live a more urban lifestyle or the artists that you want to attract. Or you could get some of your software companies to say that a walkable neighborhood is an amenity when we're trying to attract the high quality skills. So or you want it for your aging parents so that exactly. they don't impose on you to run them around. Exactly. So historically, the people's perception that I understand here is that's all well and good for everybody else, mm -hmm. and, but, but not me, so that's maybe right. I'll I'll, uh, I'll allow you to charge me a little bit of a tax because it's going to be better for everybody else, but not me. Sure. But then it'll slowly change as, as they adopt it. That, that's right. Once it becomes normal, and here's, the, here's really the big test. When a young guy invites a girl out on a date, and, his com and he says, we're going to walk or bike or use public transportation, and his competitor has a car, <laughs> does he always lose out? So, because there are an awful lot of young men who feel like they need to have a car for exactly that purpose. So, to the, and, and it is changing. I can tell you from personal experience. I have two sons. Um, our older son didn't get his driver's license until he was 21 and bought a car when he was 23, no, 22. And our younger son, He's 21, he hasn't even started the process of learning to drive. And both of them are very um, attractive, you know, <laughs> socially active. Now, we live in a community where that's common. And, you know, both of them are university students, one's in law school, the other's traveling through Asia, you know. So they have found, the, there are plenty of, lifestyles and plenty of communities where not owning a car doesn't, that owning a car is not essential for social life. But it may be that you're going to have to figure out the right models, the right examples <coughs> to make it seem cool to do that in Idaho. It may be some of your athletes and some of your outdoor people. For example, very likely you have plenty of um, river kayakers and skiers who want to only own a car for use on the weekends, but they would prefer to walk and bike and use public transit while they're commuting to work. Yeah, we have those. Sure. And think of, um, think of uh, um, the, the artists who couldn't afford, the only way that they're going to be able
able to live in that loft apartment is, or get your real estate developers and agents who have built loft apartments to talk about an urban loft, the, the growth in demand for urban loft housing. So, and, and be able to communicate that that is occurring in Idaho, in, even in your medium and smaller towns, you're probably finding some of those little, those activities. So you need to demonstrate to people that, that there is demand for that kind of lifestyle. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about death and destruction, traffic safety. Um, so Idaho is medium bad when it comes to deaths. Uh, this is the key, where is the key? Okay, this is the key number. You have 11.53 deaths per 100,000 population. Um, we have a few people here from Massachusetts. What do you think Massachusetts is? Uh, Massachusetts is, is, is half that. So if you live in Massachusetts, your, your chance, your children's chance of dying in a car crash is half. Now, the interesting thing is, if you, a lot of the traffic safety literature, it talks about how dangerous, the terrible danger of snow and ice. That snow and ice will kill you. Yet the highest, by far, the highest traffic fatality rates are in the American South. Mississippi and... Where else? And Arizona, Alabama, um, New Mexico. Oh, let's. Oh, Nevada. Is anyone in Nevada? Oh, yeah, that's North Dakota. Oh, that's North Dakota. Okay, yeah, so that's just. Yeah, okay, Oklahoma. Okay, so you guys are about average. You're in the middle. Probably better than some of your, you're definitely better than Wyoming and Montana. But, um, that is that, that doesn't consider miles driven. Though. Yeah, no, it's correlated with that. It's, it's only per capita. You see, the, if the traffic safety professionals in the past, they like to use per million, hundred million vehicle miles or billion kilometers because that made them look good. Death rates per mile declined but during the last 50 years, but mileage, per capita mileage increased so that the death rate per capita didn't decline very much at all. Per capita is the, the only thing that really matters. Hmm. That, like any health, healthiness. So anyway, um, let's look a little bit. These are, each dot there is a US state divided into the rural component, which is the dark, and the urban component, which is the light. Somebody that's taken a course in statistics interpret this graph. This is death rates per against annual vehicle miles. Highly correlated. Yeah. <laughs> what do you get if you live in one of the states, one of the rural parts of the state, where people drive a lot? <coughs> a lot of deaths. Dead bodies, that's right. And I've done the research looking at correlations with public transit and with smart growth. And essentially, it's all the same thing. If you live in an automobile dependent area where people drive a lot and you have to drive even when you're drinking and you, as soon as your teenage son turns 16, you give him a car because you're tired of chauffeuring him and your, your, your elderly aunt has to drive because she has no alternatives, that is going to be a dangerous place. All those people who moved out to the suburbs because they wanted a safe place to raise their children were mistaken. It is far safer to raise children in a walkable urban neighborhood than it is in a suburb, for this reason. Yes? What, what, how did you measure walkability? Because I've seen, I've seen some of these studies that the intersections per mile, I've right. seen you know, various things. Um, there are a number of studies that, that, look at, that use a, a number of indices, and the best that I'm aware of are by Professor Larry Frank at the University of British Columbia, and if you visit my website, DTPI, you'll see some links to some of the research on how you correlate the safety and health benefits of smart growth or walkable communities with, with health outcomes. But, but what indices does he use the most? Uh, I think he uses a fairly sophisticated set of factors. So okay. it's things like block density and um, 
and, and, and land use mix and population density. I, I can't remember. There's another, there's an outstanding, very sophisticated study by Reed Ewing and Simi Hamadi that was recently published. Super great stuff that used a very sophisticated um, smart growth index. And one of the interesting findings is they found a, a strong positive correlation between smart growth and economic mobility, defined as the, as the chance that somebody, that a child born into a lowest income quintile family will reach the highest income quintile by the time they're 30. So the chance that a poor child will become wealthy over their lifetime is highly correlated by smart growth, with smart growth. Yes? I was sort of curious if you've ever seen research that tries to concentrate on small communities that are smart growth, because I feel like a lot of times people feel kind of like, well, we're not, we're not Boston, we're not New York, so we have, what can we do with that form if right. we don't have that economic scale? Right. Like, what does it well, get us then? Some of this research, this is, this, that's, an, that's a great question. Some of this research is at the county or regional scale, but a lot of the research is also looking at it at the neighborhood scale. So it's comparing a neighbor, neighborhoods within a city. And I think that that is actually, in many ways, it's more useful. What it says is that it's okay to live in Houston. It's okay to live in Boise. It's okay that we're not telling you you have to move to a different city. We're saying you, that if you want to be safer and healthier, choose this neighborhood in Houston and help this neighborhood. Getting back to, the, to my first slide about creating paradise, try and make Houston a, a healthier, um, safer Houston. Don't move from Houston to Boston just because you want walkability. So I know it's a, it's a challenge because we're, we're you know, you, can, you see all these magazine articles that say, you know, 10 best places to raise your children, 10 best cities for small businesses or whatever. And as far as I'm concerned, that is, that is the worst approach people can take to problem solving because it's basically saying as soon as a place is undesirable on some grounds, you're going to abandon it, you're going to leave it. So the people who are interested in something like health and safety are the first ones to move rather than stay and fight to make that community healthier and safer. Does that make sense? So, and, and I would say Boise is probably, or Idaho, Idaho um, communities are probably perfect case studies for being, by, to be able to apply some of these principles to make them better places. You've got a lot of, re you know, you've got a lot of good things here. Okay, so let's, let's proceed. Oh, I do want to make one point here. When people advocate smart growth, usually it's about infrastructure cost savings and environmental benefits. When have you heard a smart growth advocate say that the best thing about smart growth is it reduces traffic fatalities? You have. Okay, well you are fantastic, you're smart. Okay, this I think is a terrific opportunity, and it's an opportunity to partner with real estate professionals and developers. You, if you don't, I'm, you probably actually, you, pr you probably already have some smart developers who are doing things like building off departments and promoting walkable neighborhoods. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you weren't, I would suggest that you arrange for a bunch of developers and real estate professionals to take a bus ride to some place that does, because that, to me, is the most persuasive argument in favor of these reforms, is to show that there's market demand, that the businesses will make more of a profit by building walkable, multimodal neighborhoods, and that, therefore, a partnership between developers and, and local governments that will deliver things like sidewalks and bike lanes and, um, and, and nice transit stations are, is valuable. Okay, let me, I want to make sure we get at least a few more of these slides. Okay, what gets people moving? Sure, you can give people a gym pass. Again, turning something into a commodity. Exercise, is exercise a commodity? Can you buy exercise? Is that a real photo or do you It photo is a real <laughs> photo. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can, you can you, you can basically know what happened. The architect in 
in Arizona or San Diego, California or something says, okay, we got this stairs, we gotta put an escalator in. And then they just happen to rent that property to the fitness club. But you see it all the time. Another example is we're trying to get people to exercise more. How many buildings are designed with the stairwell more attractive than the elevator entrance? Almost none of them. Okay, anyway, if you want people, you know, you can give away gym memberships. And if somebody is going on dates, they will exercise. But once they couple up, <laughs> what motivation do you have? Who, you know, the gyms, they sell five memberships for every slot they can accommodate. Why do they do that? Because four out of five people don't stick with it, especially lifelong. If you want, if you, there's somebody you care about who isn't getting enough exercise, and you want them to exercise more, virtually the only successful strategies are, for most people, especially people who are already overweight, sedentary, and aging, is to get them to live in a walkable neighborhood and give them a dog. Because there's good research showing people who live in households with dogs walk more. Okay, so here's um, Boise currently, walk score, mediocre. My guess is, well, you can see that there are some neighborhoods that aren't quite so bad. None of them are great, but, um, but there's a lot of potential. Um, the term, this I think is important, is that the term traffic engineers now use for incremental improvements in walking and cycling is complete streets. So if you want to improve walkability, you don't necessarily need to focus on a walking, a pedestrian plan, although that can be useful. What you want is a complete streets policy. How is Boise doing? Do you have a complete streets policy in Boise? Yes. Okay. You have a bunch of smart streets. Yeah. You have a bunch of smart young traffic in, or uh, roadway engineers and designers that really understand how to get this thing accomplished? We don't have a bunch, but we have a okay. growing number. That's what you want. <laughs> okay, let's do a fun little exercise because it's really important to get this visual. Okay, so could this be a street someplace here in Boise or somewhere in Idaho? Mm -hmm. Generic anywhere. Okay. Is that, is that attractive? No. Is it high value? No. If you were looking from a, if you were God looking down on this little parcel of land, um, it's not paradise. It's not paradise. And what would most of the landscape look like, looking from above? The asphalt. Yeah, asphalt. Uh, parking lots, <coughs> roads, and buildings. Okay. Let's see what would happen if the city in this area invested a couple million dollars to make some some nice. Uh, infrastructure, some nice sidewalks and mid block or uh, 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 um, cross uh, uh, islands, uh, refuges, and a bridge across the busy roadway, and it attracted development. And you got some street trees in, and it matured. And you notice all the people are really good looking, and <laughs> the cars are all shiny clean, and chairs. Okay. But here's the point I want to make. Let's say you're city councilor or mayor, and you want to maximize the value. You want to create more economic activity and extract more rent and taxes from this property. You just invested two million dollars. What do you see? What is just? What is? What have you seen just happen there? That has become. <coughs> valuable real estate. You have increased the value, however you measure it, whether it's, it's land values or tax revenue per acre or whatever, you've increased it by an order of magnitude. You've also created those affordable housing over shops where you can age in place, uh, low income students can live, you don't need to own a car. This is the place to live if you want to not own a car. Um, got to spill that. The first thing that wants to come there is a gas station or a drive-through. Well, or that, that's right. And um, I, th that is the paradigm shift. 
And you can literally say, if somebody proposes a gas station, you can literally say, oh, that's so 20th century. The market is shifting, and partly because gas stations have become super efficient. Most gas stations now have one clerk overseeing a dozen automated pumps. So one gas station serves what used to be 10 gas stations. And the need for gas stations is plummeting. So it may be, I'm not saying there will be no new gas stations in Idaho, but there will be very few. But what you can say is that this probably meets the needs of future residents more than the previous design. Does somebody have their hand up? Yes. So, oh. I, I, you know, I love these little centers, and it's great. Um, most of Idaho is not going to support very many of those, but most of Idaho could support a lot of walkable, residential, single-family, small lot neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, I love this stuff. Mm -hmm. How do we make the paradigm shift on that suburban housing now to the walkable, right. small lot? Well, let's we'll, we'll, let's talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Um, because there are a few slides I want to I want to get to. Yes. I just wanted to make a, a comment about the sort of low density uses because I live in a neighborhood that's I mean I'm in Boston but I'm in the sort of older part of Boston that's actually not that accessible and there's a really interesting CVS that they developed and it's pretty low density but what they did with the parking space they said we'll give you enough parking spots for a low density CVS but we're actually going to make them public city parking spaces rather than making them only CBS parking spaces. And it's a way to say, you know, it's still that old form, but we're starting to build in the ability to kind of share that space when things start building up around it so you don't, every time you build something like that, right. you don't have to build another parking lot necessarily because there's different patterns of demand, right? right. Restaurants use parking at different times than, yeah. than you know, the Dunkin' Donuts, then, and, and even though they have that little form, they can still use some of their other space right. more efficiently. So let me very briefly say there, there are three issues here. One is there's some ways that um, municipal policies can support what you could call new urbanism. And the second is that there are there are some efficiencies, like the parking parking Efficient parking use is just one of many efficiencies if you can get activities to, to occur closer together. Getting back to your first question, I think the main message is that yes, there are a lot of people who prefer larger lot single family homes, but the United States actually has a pretty good supply, existing stock of large lot single family homes. The question from a development perspective is where is the shortage? And at least some research, especially uh, Chris Nelson, and you might be familiar with his work, he's projecting that most of the growth, and I think there's some of the more recent real estate um, market trends are supporting this, is that the profits are greater in the denser areas. Again, it's not saying everybody's going to live in high rise, but at the margin, there are a lot. There, are, there does seem to be some demand. And my guess is, if the municipal government in Meridian or in whatever, if, no, let's say, if there's evidence of <coughs> demand, then the municipal government can put into place the infrastructure that allows that demand to be met. And I suspect that there are a lot of places in Idaho where that could work. Okay, so let's, there are a few more concepts I want to make sure we cover. One is that um, as people become wealthier, they, they, they shift from, from, from meals at McDonald's to sitting down in restaurants with tablecloths. And they expect their coffee to be espresso rather than standard. And they, they do all these things. And rationally, if we want to attract affluent people to use public transit, we have to think in terms of high quality. So right now, the message is, if you expect high quality, you're not going to use public transit, because we just don't serve that market. 
And I suspect that there are opportunities, even in places, even in Idaho, to start serving a somewhat more upscale market. For example, by offering Wi-Fi service and an espresso machine on board. And I suspect that there are a lot of people, especially those software engineers that want to be able to spend their commute time staring at their little devices, who would prefer to, to, to take the bus rather than drive. Think of the Google buses in San Francisco if you can get the package assembled. So part of it is a commute trip reduction program and working with the employers and having that nice bus service and marketing it as the, as the luxury commute option. Okay, and so you can think more sophisticated about the various roles that public transit plays. plays. You can pay a lot of attention to the stations. <coughs> so the station is as important as the vehicle. What if instead of waiting for that nice bus at, at the side of a road with a sign that says bus stop, you were sitting in a, in a cappuccino bar looking out looking at the sign on the wall that tell, tells you how many minutes before your express bus to downtown is going to be here and you're working on your mobile on your uh, your tablet computer using the the, 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 the coffee shops um, Wi-Fi service and it's five minutes it's three minutes it's one minute it's 30 seconds you grab your notebook computer you take your espresso walk right onto the bus your RFID payment system pays your pays your your fare you sit down at your seat fold down the little work table put your espresso into the cup holder and the the bus has the same Wi-Fi network as the um, as the um, as the coffee shop, so you don't have to reconnect. Do you think that would attract some people who are currently driving? Is that expensive to assemble all those components? Not really. It's actually very cheap. It's just a matter of getting the business model so that you're putting all those things together and having enough demand so that you're talking about a few dozen people at each coffee shop, you know, at each stop who are taking advantage of those services. There's a bunch of information improvements that can make this work better. Um, there's tourist trip management. So let's say I was, I was a Japanese, I was a young Japanese tourist looking for a fun place to travel, but I don't drive. Or I'm a little old lady from Germany. Or I'm a couple that has just arrived uh, from, from uh, um, from, um, um, uh, from, from, from Canada, and we want to visit Idaho. We want to go experience some of your outdoorsy adventures, but we don't want to rent a car. Does Idaho accommodate those? Would there be more tourist activity here, more tourist dollars, if, if Idaho could promote itself as a car-free tourist destination? I can pretty much guarantee you would. All you have to do is go up to Banff, and you'll see it's crawling with foreign tourists who are spending lots of money. And one of the one of the attractions is they packaged it so you don't need a car. Walking well, cycling improvements, you saw that school and transport school um, and campus transport management, affordable housing, affordable accessible. <coughs> housing. So a house in a walkable neighborhood is equivalent to a better car. Mo accessibility can substitute for mobility. How well is Idaho doing making sure that when somebody wants to find affordable housing,